Good evening. Thank you. If, if we haven't had the chance to meet, I'm Robbie Aderberg, and it's great to be with you. I'm uh, one of the pastors, and uh, I'm wondering this Christmas season how your shopping is going. I, I've spent the last couple of days trying to, you know, get Christmas done, um, you know, embracing all of the joy of getting it done, that's for sure. And uh, I'm just wondering, because, you know, there are supply chain issues, and we've noticed some things that have been harder to get than we had anticipated, and actually it wasn't for Christmas, but recently my son needed some basketball shoes because basketball season is here, and it was amazing the, 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 how scarce the supply was. You know, that you go looking, and there's just not that many options available, and as Americans, we are so used to options. Lots of options, as many options as you can even imagine, and then some more that somebody else dreamed up that you think are nuts, but at least they're there because they should be, because we're Americans. And it's just amazing how few, relatively few options there are. And the ones that are there are so incredibly overpriced. And so you get to pay extra for something that you didn't really want in the first place. Welcome to Christmas 2021. And so after scouring and scouring, we were finally able to find a pretty good deal on actually a great pair of shoes for him. But, you know, the reality is that some things are hard to come by right now. And it's scarcity. But this season, it's not just, I think, scarcity of goods. You know, it, we're in a sermon series right now because so often in the Christmas season, it's actually about not just a scarcity of things out there, but a scarcity of things in here, a scarcity of resources, a scarcity of that which will sustain us. You know, that we want this time of year not just to endure, not just to get by, not just to get the tasks done, but we actually want to enjoy them. Is it possible? to experience the wonder and awe of the Christmas season and have that carry us on beyond and last? Is it possible to be filled to full and stay that way and not hit the January low? You know, is it possible to stay full you know, and not feel hungry again? You know, that's that experience. If you eat, eat you know, too much donuts, too much pasta, too much rice, you'll be full, really full for a moment, but then really hungry pretty quickly. And that's often what Christmas is like. But I, I believe that the promise that God has for us in Christmas is a full that will last. And so this series that we're in right now is called Much, Abundance in a Time of Scarcity. And it's because we have this conviction that in the gospel, there are resources for you and for me that will not just help us get through this, but to embrace and experience the fullness and the, and the majesty and the wonder and awe of the Christmas season, and then even have plenty of staying power well beyond in actually every season of life. In the gospel, there is plenty of hope and faith. That's what we spent our first two weeks talking about. We can be overflowing with, with hope and with faith. And if you didn't catch those, you can, you can catch those on our podcast or on our YouTube channel, PCTRNJ. And tonight we're going to talk about joy. You know, we lit the candle of joy on the Advent wreath. Joy, I started to do a search of how many Christmas songs have joy in the title, and I just stopped. Like, I couldn't come to a definitive number because there's just so many. Joy is like ubiquitous with Christmas, and yet... I would argue is really at times hard to come by. And so we're going to jump in tonight and try to see if joy, truly sustaining, abundant joy is available for us. And we're going to look in Luke chapter 10. And so you can follow along, I think, if, it, if it's on the screen. But listen for these words from God to you. Whatever your circumstances this evening, allow this to speak into your life. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Go, I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. Do not take a purse or bag or sandals and do not greet anyone on the road. The 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. He replied, 
I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I've given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. However, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. At that time, Jesus, full of joy through the Holy Spirit, said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this is what you were pleased to do. All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows who the Son is except the Father, and no one knows who the Father is except the Son and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Then he turned to his disciples and said privately, Blessed are the eyes that see what you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings wanted to see what you see, but did not see it, and to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. And let's pray as we move into this together. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for this opportunity to gather here in this place. Thank you for this time that's been carved out of our week to seek you. Lord, thank you that when we seek you, when we seek you with with everything that we have, that you promise that we will find you. So Lord, this evening in your word, may we find you. May we hear from you and may you speak into the depth of our lives, our hearts, our souls, and may you give us the grace to respond that we may be full with joy. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. So in this story, we're told that Jesus actually sends out 72 people. I mean, just really quick, we often think of Jesus, and he had his 12, his disciples that were close to him, and we think they're like the elite of the elite, and they're like the super religious all-stars. Well, here Jesus is sending out 72 who are not the all-stars. These are normal folks that have been learning from Jesus, taking steps toward him, and he says, all right, come on, you want to take the next step? All right, go, go out into all the towns and all the villages where I'm going to go and begin to prepare the way. Begin to tell them about me, about the good news in Jesus. And just, this isn't really the core of the message, but if you're a follower of Jesus, just hear that the work of spreading the hope and the good news of Jesus Christ is not the work of the pastors and the religious all-stars and elite. It is the work of every follower of Jesus. And they, they had a lot that they did not know. They had a lot that they didn't know how to answer. They had their own questions, let alone knowing how to answer the questions of other people, and yet they were sent and they went just to go. And so, I mean, the reality is Jesus sent them, as he said, because the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few, using that very clear agricultural image. There's a whole lot of people that don't know me, and they need to know me. It's the best thing for them. It will change everything about their life and their eternity. And so pray to God that he will raise up more workers for the harvest. In other words, pray that when you go out, that you'll be effective, and that those people will turn around and they will become followers of me so that there will be more and more and more workers. And the harvest is still incredibly plentiful in our day. That actually in 2020, do you know that only 58% of Americans identified as Christian? 58%. I mean, it's almost half of the people that you know aren't living a life where they know know Jesus and know the love of God for them in him. And so the workers are few, and so hear the call to go. Now Jesus says, I'm, I'm sending you out, though, as lambs among wolves. I mean, that's a pretty vivid image, isn't it? I mean, you got little, little precious sheep. They're cute and cuddly and also very delicious. I enjoy them very much. And so do wolves. And so it's a very clear image that they're going out into a world and into a situation that is incredibly dangerous, and it's dangerous for a follower of Jesus. It's a promise. It's actually a guarantee that if you're a follower of Jesus, that you're going to run into situations where you will be as a lamb among wolves, where you may find yourself afraid, you may find yourself to be actually under attack, where if you take a stand based on the values the ethics that come from a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, then there may be people that look at you and say, you're just, you're whack. You're you're strange. You're weird. How could you believe that? You are, then fill in all sorts of other things. You're bigoted. You're, You're out of control. 
And so you may find yourself at odds with folks as a lamb among wolves. And by the way, you're the lamb, not the wolf. It doesn't mean you get to go around biting people. It means you're gentle, even as they find what you perhaps are sharing or standing on offensive. And, and when you start to share about Jesus and you start to share, hey, th- there is really only hope for you to be reconciled with the Almighty God through Jesus Christ. But guess what? There is hope through Jesus Christ. That's really offensive to people. And so they're not going like to like to hear it. As much as it's good news, it's like, hey, this is a path back to God. They're going to hear it. And, and some people are going to hear it as, wait a second, I don't need a Savior. I don't need somebody to help me. I, I'm making life how I want it to be. And you're telling me that I, I need somebody? No, no. And so the message itself is going to be offensive. And so you'll find yourself as a lamb among wolves. And, and hiding behind this whole passage, this is just all the background and the setup for the big question that we're looking at tonight, which is, is it possible, is it possible to have joy, the kind of abundant, over, overflowing, sustaining joy in this kind of situation, in a situation that's hard, that's dangerous, that's challenging, in a place where you find yourself you're perhaps facing rejection, maybe even physical hardship, pain, Is is joy really possible? And and what is this joy, if it is? And and we know that this is the question even behind the scene for for Jesus and these 72, because when they come back in verse 17, they say to Jesus, hey, Jesus, Lord, even the demons submit to us in, in your name. I mean, they are fired up. They're rejoicing, experiencing, expressing joy at this incredible reality. And Jesus says, yeah, you know what? I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. And he came to this earth. But I've given you authority over him and over all of his minions. They will not harm you because my kingdom is advancing to take back from him everything that he has stolen from God. And so you will not be harmed. They will not be able to stand against you. However, Jesus says, however, that's not the point. Do not rejoice that they submit to you. Rejoice that your your names are written in heaven. And so in other words, yes is the short answer. There is joy available to you and to me in the midst of the danger, the hardship, the challenge, the frustration. And yet, it's important that we figure out what exactly do we mean and does Jesus mean by joy and where does it come from? Because joy, ultimately, we find here, comes from our perspective, and it comes from presence. And so we're going to first just look at perspective, that particularly perspective of of what is joy. C.S. Lewis uh, quoted him a number of times here, an incredible thinker. He was a staunch, staunch atheist. In his early years, coming up through his young adulthood, and he became you know, a professor in university and continued, he, he was eager to hold on to his atheism. As a matter of fact, he didn't want anything to do with God. And so his autobiography, his spiritual journey autobiography is called Surprised by Joy because in his effort to resist God, to push him off, God continued to pursue him and he found himself surprised that he had ultimately found the source of his joy. But in the midst of this autobiography, he he writes this. He says, joy must be sharply distinguished both from happiness and pleasure. Joy, in my sense, has indeed one characteristic and one only in common with them, the fact that anyone who has experienced it will want it again. So he's acknowledging there's a difference between joy, happiness, and pleasure, but he's saying that there's one thing they all have in common. Once you've tasted it, you're going to want any of them again. You've been happy, you're going to want to be happy again. You've experienced pleasure, you're going to want pleasure again. You've experienced joy, you're going to want joy again. But that's where their similarities stop. And I think this is part of why joy for us is a scarce resource in our life. Because often I think we're not looking for joy, we're looking for happiness. See, because happiness is, is that feeling of pleasure or delight or gladness. It's that state of being 
that comes from all sorts of reasons. And sometimes those reasons are in our control, sometimes those reasons are out of our control, but it's that feeling we just want to be happy. It's like, you know, it's like Disneyland, Disney World all the time. Right? If you could just experience feeling, well, for some, that, that's like the worst case scenario. Never mind. <laughs> but for others, the happiest place on earth, and wherever that is for you, that you know that happiness. And related to that happiness is pleasure, but they are different. Because happiness is that general feeling, that general state of being, and pleasure is the state of enjoyment that particularly comes from or is derived from things that are working out the way you like it, the way you want it. You know, when, when the meal comes together and you're experiencing it the way you want and, and you're enjoying that moment, that's pleasure. When, when the plan comes together and it works out, there's just incredible pleasure from that and satisfaction from that. See, that, that's pleasure. So happiness is the general feeling, state of being. Pleasure is when we're able to actually have the feeling because things are the way we want them to be. And the problem with both happiness and pleasure is that they're both temporary. They're both fleeting. They both come and they go. You know, if somebody gives you a new car, it's an amazing thing, and you're going to feel incredible happiness, I would guess. Most of us would. You know, the new car smell, and you love to feel the engine go, and you love, you know, all the new gadgets and a new car. You know, that feeling of happiness, but over time, even that excitement and feeling about the new car is going to fade. Or you get a new phone, you know, and, you, and you, you love having that, and you, you just, you, you just kind of want to look at it, and then you want to touch it, and you just keep picking it up, and you don't, you're not even trying to do anything. You're just like, ooh, I have my new phone. And, you know, it's that feeling, but that even starts to go away. You stop, you stop picking it up. You stop looking at it. You stop, stop going after it. It just kind of now sits there. It becomes much more utilitarian over time, and you're no longer deriving the pleasure from it. It's temporary. Those types, that happiness and pleasure will not sustain us. Those are not an adequate substitute for joy. Because joy is lasting. Joy is similar. There is a feeling associated to it, with it, a feeling of enjoyment. There is a feeling of, of satisfaction. But one that is rooted not in the temporary, not in the ups and downs, but one that no matter what's going on can sustain you and carry you. And we can see it play out in this passage. Because they're saying, Jesus, hey, the demons submit to us in your name. That's the source of their pleasure, right? It was working out the way they wanted it to. They were successful in achieving the, thing that they, the goal that they had for their life. And the thing is, this time it worked. This time they submitted but there's other times where it doesn't work. In Matthew 17, there's a, a man who brings his, his son to the disciples. And he brings him to the disciples because he has, he's having these seizures and is suffering greatly. And the seizures are so strong at times that he, he ends up throwing himself into the fire, into water, and dr trying to drown himself. And it's all happening because there's, there's this demon that's at work in his life. Well, the disciples aren't able to cast this demon out. So the man finally comes to Jesus, and Jesus, you know, it's like, oh, come on, bring the boy. You unbelieving generation, what am I going to do with you? And as soon as he sees the boy, he casts the demon out, heals the boy, makes him whole, and then the disciples call Jesus aside later, and they're like, man, why couldn't we do that? Remember, you gave us that authority, and we were doing it all over the place, and things were working out, and we were rejoicing because they were submitting, you know, to, to us at your name, but this one didn't work that way. We're feeling a little embarrassed. We're feeling ashamed because we couldn't accomplish the goal. We aren't, we aren't rejoicing anymore. It's not sustaining. We're questioning. We're wondering. It's not working out this time. You know, Jesus just says, it's because you have too little faith. They're rebuked. You know, their source of joy was not joy. It was a happiness, a satisfaction that they were successful, that they were able to do the things that they had wanted to do. And when our lives are similarly based, when you're putting your joy, your stock in your ability to succeed or accomplish something, to reach the goals that you have for your life, when it's things that you're laying out, maybe you'll get them. And when you get them, man, isn't it great? It feels awesome. But then you wanted that promotion and you didn't get it. You, you were hoping to go on a date and got shot down. 
that it's real, isn't it? It's real. You know. Yeah, and it hurts. We're not rejoicing. I got shot down, right? No, we're riding the roller coaster of happiness and pleasure, the up and the down. That's not sustaining. And when things get hard, man, there's, it's no longer something that we can tap into and say, okay, I just got to remember feeling happy. You know, the, the Peter Pan, I'm not sure had it right. I know that they had to think happy thoughts when they could, you know, start flying away. And it's like, yeah, but when things get really hard, it's really hard to think happy thoughts, isn't it? And those happy thoughts aren't really enough to pull us out of it when you've lost someone that you love or when you've hit a rock bottom. And so it can't be something that's temporary. Jesus is saying, don't rejoice in those things that are temporary. Don't rejoice in happiness, in pleasure. Don't, don't put your stock in those things because they're gonna la- they aren't going to last. And then you're going to have to go for them again. When they wear out, you keep going again. This is what leads to addictive cycles. Because, man, it was really hard for a minute Life was, ta- was really hard. And when I go and grab this or I do that, then, man, that boosts me for a minute. I feel happy. I get to ignore the feeling of hurt and pain for a moment, but it always wears off. And so then that feeling of shame, disappointment, grief, it all comes back again. And how do I get out of it? Oh, I go back for the same thing. Problem is, the second time you go back for it, it doesn't help as much as the first time. And so it's always with diminishing return. And so you keep reaching and reaching and reaching and reaching. And it leads to devastation, not to joy that's sustaining. This is why, this is why the Bible warns about alcohol. Not because alcohol in and of itself is wrong but because it's a cheap substitute for joy that sustains. Jesus turned water to wine. He was good with it. As long as it had its appropriate place and wasn't the source of joy that was gonna sustain you through the hard time. He had something else in mind. He has something else in mind for all of us. A joy that cannot be taken away no matter the circumstance, a joy that can sustain no matter the up and down, a joy that couldn't be taken away because it wasn't achieved by us in the first place. He says rejoice. Rejoice that your names are written in heaven. What does he mean? Rejoice that your names are written in heaven. What he's getting at is he's saying, Your source of joy, the thing that you really want to get your joy from, is nothing of this world. Because everything of this world is going to pass away. The thing that's going to really give you sustaining joy is well beyond this world, that your name is written in heaven, meaning that there is a place for you that's been reserved in relationship with the Father, reconciled, forgiven, in a relationship with God where you know him and he knows you, where you experience the fullness of his pleasure, which his pleasure becomes the source of your joy. You heard in our Advent uh, wreath lighting, this passage from, from Galatians, which is about the fruit of the Spirit. You know, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, love, joy. Joy is a fruit of the Spirit. In other words, joy, on one hand, is a gift that God wants to give you, wants to grow in you, wants to provide for you. Not something that you achieve, you earn, you get, but it's a gift to be given to you, and it's given because it is this reality of, hey, there's a place for you in relationship with God, and a byproduct of that is the Spirit putting joy into your life. Because a relationship with God, unlike the date that rejected you, will never reject you. He's accepted you, loved you, treasured you, cherished you. You're his. And so that becomes then the source of joy. This is, this is what presence is about when we start talking about presence. It's the presence of God. The presence of God himself that gives you the gift of joy. Not something that you earn. But man, we struggle Why is it that we struggle with gifts so much? Jesus says in in verse 21 that we read, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Man, this gets at it, I think. Do you know any kids that have a problem receiving gifts at Christmas? (laughs) Do you know any? 
I don't know any. They, I mean, the whole point of it's like, that's, that's part of the magic of Christmas is the eyes light up and the delight and the wonder and the joy of receiving the gifts. They did nothing to earn it except for they woke up that day as your child, as your nephew, as your, your niece, your cousin, whatever it is. They woke up and there were the gifts and they weren't like, no, 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 no. <laughs> you know what? I actually have been naughty this year. Bring the coal. <laughs> I haven't had one child tell me that. And I've got four, so... It's a small sample size, big enough. But children don't have a problem receiving gifts. They may have trouble saying thank you sometimes, but they have no problem receiving it, enjoying it, embracing it. Why is it that adults do? How uncomfortable would you be if the person in the, in the row in front of you or the row behind you just presented you with a gift, an awesome gift, maybe a gift well beyond your budget. How comfortable would you feel if that iPhone 13 was in that box? I mean, it's strange, right? That we'd probably feel pretty uncomfortable. We would be reluctant to take it, so we try to say, no, 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 don't do, don't do that. And then they'd insist, and then we'd have to take it. And then we'd go home, and we'd open it, because hopefully we don't have to open it in front of them, because, man, that would be so embarrassing to have to, like, actually find out what it is, because what if it's a nose hair trimmer, and that's, like, really, okay, maybe that was a subtle hint that I needed to do something different. But, but what if it is actually an iPhone instead, and then, like, then I, I won't even know how to react. But I go home, and I open it all on my own, and then I realize, oh, my gosh, they've given me this. What's your first thought? What do I need to give them, probably, right? How can I possibly return it? How can I possibly do equal or better? See, we have a problem receiving the gifts. And I think this is perhaps for some of us the reason why we struggle with joy. Because we're struggling to receive the gift that God wants to give us the gift of his acceptance, of his love, of his presence that becomes our joy. Instead, we live life every day as if we had better earn it, we had better pay him back, we better figure out a gift that we can give him that's worthy of, some, uh, of at least a little bit of what he would give us, and so we, we gotta figure out how I can be good enough, I can check the right boxes, I can, I can give enough, I can serve enough, I can care enough about other people, I can vote a certain way, whatever it is. We're trying to say, how can I become worthy of this gift that you wanna give me? And as long as you're trying to live that way, you will never receive the fullness of joy that is gonna satisfy and sustain. Because life becomes tedious work, doesn't it? And there's no joy in tedious work. I don't know about you, but I really do love decorating for Christmas. I love Christmas lights in particular. But man, I get so frustrated when that one section of the string goes out and the rest of it's going okay. And, and you know, you you just start to go, okay, what am I gonna do? This day and age, we're usually just throwing it out and we're buying a new string if we're honest, aren't we? But have you ever sat there and you've tested every bulb, you've pried out and get one that you know works and you stick it in there and you go, okay, no, and you keep going and you keep going and you keep going. And what's that task like for you? Is that filled with joy? Maybe it's filled with joy the moment that you find the one that was out that causes the whole string to light up. That's joy, but the problem is that's happiness and pleasure because here's what happens frequently. You fix this one, you get it set, and the next day you come back and now a different section is out, isn't it? So it's, if we are gonna have it be something that we are earning, we're achieving, life is gonna become the tedious work of having to test every Christmas bulb, and it might come for a moment where we feel like, you know what, today, yeah, you know what? I am worthy of it today, so I am gonna feel a little of that joy. But what happens tomorrow when I make the choice that I know I'm not supposed to make, when I go back to those old patterns of behavior that I know I shouldn't be living in and yet can't seem to get myself out of? What happens when I keep failing and the joy then, am I worthy? Not today. See, it's not sustaining. 
It's tedious, hard work, but the gift that God wants to give you is the gift of joy that cannot be taken away from you because it is the gift of himself, his presence with you in it. The gift that cannot be taken because it's already been given and can't be undone. That's what Christmas was about, right? That God would send his son He was called Emmanuel, God with us. The very presence of God on earth. God coming to us to find us in the midst of our despair, of our frustration, of our challenges, of the ups and the downs, of our happiness, our pleasure, our delight, our despair. To come seek us. And to say, you know what? Stop stop running on that treadmill. Stop running on that hamster wheel trying to prove that you're worthy. You're never gonna get there. Stop trying to achieve and earn your happiness and your joy through pleasure. It's always gonna leave you wanting more. Instead, receive the gift that I have for you, my very life for you, so that despite your failure, despite your pain, despite your frustration, you can know that you are mine and that I am with you always. See, because... His presence, remember, is that joy. When you're doing that tedious task of of Christmas lights, do you sit there and do it alone? That's pretty miserable. (laughs) I was doing it this afternoon. And then my almost eight-year-old came and joyfully coming like a golden retriever puppy is like, hey, hey, can I help? (laughs) Little does she know how awful this task is. Yeah, but she didn't care because we were going to do it together. And when we were doing it together, that changed everything. And it was fun. And I enjoyed it. And God's saying, I want to be with you day in and day out. I want to change your entire experience. It's no longer just a tedious labor, but it's enjoyment. We're sharing, you're sharing life with me. And I'm sharing with you. And when you have that joy that cannot be taken because it has been purchased with the life of Jesus Christ and it is given through the very presence of Jesus, his spirit with you, present day in and day out, no matter what is coming, it changes everything. And it can transform even the darkest of dark places. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a pastor in in Nazi Germany. And he was a part of, uh, of the resistance was pushing against what Hitler was doing, and eventually he was arrested. And so he was put into prison for quite a while. And he didn't know what was gonna happen, and ultimately he was executed. But along the way, the intensity of fighting began to get worse and worse and worse. And so the bombings were happening, and the building that he's in, the jail, is actually shaking, and he's in there with with other prisoners and guards, and and he's aware that around him, these people are terrified. And he continued to come back over and over again to the, the foundation and the truth. Don't get me wrong. There were moments of despair. There were moments of frustration. There were moments of grief. There were moments of fear. All of these that he's so transparent about in his writing. But there was through it, this thread, his relationship with God, the very presence of Jesus with him in that cell that was sustaining him, that gave him a joy that was, as he said, contagious. As a matter of fact, he says this. He says, the the calmness and joy with which we meet what is laid on us are as infectious as the terror that I see among the people here at each new attack. He's saying, when the bombs start hitting, When life starts getting hard and worse, man, that fear is contagious. The despair is contagious. And yet, so is the joy that is not found in achievement, not found in circumstance, not found in situation, not found in happiness or pleasure. The joy that is rooted in the gift of God through Jesus Christ and his very presence is just as infectious. And that's what the desperate and dying world needs. Go out with joy and go as a lamb among wolves. Go out with the joy of the Lord and it will be evident. You don't have to go and shove Jesus down somebody's throat. If you live with joy in this 
world right now, it is going to be obvious that you have something very different that the people are going to desperately want and they're going to want to know and all you're going to have to say is, my joy is not rooted in happiness and pleasure in things that are temporary, but it is a gift of God through Jesus Christ and his presence with me day in and day out. It started at Christmas, it went through the cross and is present in his resurrection and his Holy Spirit in me. That's my joy. That's a different way to live, and it's contagious. That's an abundance of joy in a world of scarcity. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we acknowledge when, when we're honest and we look at our lives, we, we do often derive our joy from, from our own success, our own achievement, through other people, through these, these experiences of happiness and pleasure, having things work out the way that we want them to. God, we, we just acknowledge that before you, that we're works in progress. So Lord, we ask for your forgiveness, and we ask that you would renew for us the joy of our salvation the joy of knowing that our names are written in heaven, that there is a place for us that no one can take away, that is a relationship with you where you are present to us day in and day out. May that reality grow and grow in significance in our lives, that it would be, you would be the source of our joy, that we could go out and we'd just, we'd have a different way of living that would be contagious, that others would come to know the hope and the joy that we have in Jesus Christ. It's in his name that we pray, amen.